Welcome to Archery Talk 101 podcast, your guide to better archery skills. We'll bring you the latest tips, tricks, and expert advice, but that's not all. We'll also have interviews with top archers and industry professionals and reviews of the latest gear and equipment and much more. Hi, my name is Roy Cantabur. I'm your host today on Archie Talk 101, and we have Mike on the line with us uh, today, and we're going to talk Archie with him and see how things are going on in his world. Uh, welcome, uh, Mike. Well, thanks, Roy. Good to be here. Well, how about if you introduce yourself and tell us a little something about you so we kind of get to know you? Sure. Well, um, I am the um, owner and president of uh, Trees and Camo and um, also the owner of No Scent Technologies. Um, no Scent is a scent elimination product uh, based uh, with an enzyme formula. And of course, Trees and Camo um, is a camouflage company. Um, we also make uh, Zen Outdoor Apparel, which is more of a fishing line as well. So those are those three products um, keep us busy in the hunting industry. And um, it's kind of like um, uh, doing what you love. You, you never work a day in your life, right? Right. That's true. <laughs> So how long have you had those businesses? Um, we we started No Scent about six years ago. Um, and, you know, with the formulas and launching the products uh, in that line. And then about four years ago, my wife and I, we bought a controlling interest in, of um, Treason, which the parent company is Zen Apparel. And that kind of started the whole ball rolling. Um we live in eastern Georgia and uh, love to hunt and be outdoors all the time. So it just was a, a perfect fit for us. Yeah, that, that sounds sounds kind of interesting getting into that. And, and uh, um, you know, if, if you want to uh, share your different uh, companies and sites, you know, go right ahead. Um, yeah. Know, if you want to share, you can just bring up share screen and uh, um, walk us through the, the different sites if you would like. Oh sure, that'd be that'd be great. I'll I'll do that. Um, the I'll share uh, our treason um, website first. Hopefully, you can uh, you can yep. see that. I can see it. Yep. Okay. So obviously, we've got our Black Friday sale going on still through the end of the month for another six hours. Uh, and Treason is one of the brands. It's the major brand uh, of Zen Apparel. And we've been making camouflage clothing for uh, about 13, almost 14 years. And uh, we offer a full line of products. Um, these are just some of the products that are on sale. But we, we offer men's products, women's products, um, base layers, bino harnesses, turkey vests, and if I go down here to to men's hunting gear, we've got what we call an early season uh, pattern, which is uh, looks like this. It's it's green, you know, for turkey hunting and and bow season. And then uh, for late season, um, we have the the same type of pattern. It's just gray and brown, so it blends in you know super well to the time of year when there's no leaves on the trees. And we offer everything from ultralight products to heavyweight products to keep you cold when it, or keep you warm when it's really cold. Um, and like I said, we, we have products for men and women, early season and late season. And then um, the Zen Apparel, which is a fishing line. It's a UPF performance fabrics. So it's gonna give you a lot of sun protection, 50 plus in the UPF meter. Uh, we offer hoodies, uh, long sleeve shirts, traditional fishing shirts, long sleeve that, that roll up. And then you've got a short sleeve fishing shirt, polo shirt, kind of like for golf, and then men's shorts, and then women's hoodies and women's shorts as well. And all these are performance fabrics, the same as in our uh, treason line. Uh, all of our fabrics are performance or technical fabrics, meaning they're going to be water repellent or waterproof, windproof, 
sun resistant with the UPF rating of 50 plus. Um, all of our products are guaranteed for life. Uh, so you never have to worry about, you know, the quality of the product. If there's ever a manufacturer's defect, you just let us know, we'll send you a new product. And uh, we've been standing behind that guarantee for um, the entire life of the company. Um, like here's our, here's one of our very popular products. This is our performance grade men's puffer. Happens to be 40% off right now, which is an exceptional deal. Yeah, and it is. <laughs> it, it's made of a synthetic down. So it's 80 times warmer than down. It only weighs seven ounces and it'll keep you warm with just a t-shirt underneath uh, down to about 20 degrees. Um, it's ultra lightweight. It's uh, made to be light and it's made to be warm. And uh, that's the nature of this product. And it's it's a great product. We sell these all over the United States, all over the world, really. We have a very strong presence in South Africa and um, uniquely, maybe not so uniquely, um, we have a very, very strong presence in Hawaii. We may be the number one camel company in Hawaii with our early season green. So, I mean, that's kind of uh, basics about, about no scent, or excuse me, about treason. And then uh, if I go to our no scent website, no scent.us, uh, these are our products. Um, we... We have the field spray, hair and body wash, laundry pods, and a deodorant. And all of our products in the no scent line are super safe. We don't use any chemicals. Uh, we don't put any dyes or any fragrances into the no scent products. Um, even our deodorant doesn't have aluminum. Uh, it's very safe. The no scent product is one of the only, it's one of two actually products in the scent elimination industry that is safe uh, for your skin. It's called skin safe. Everything else, because it's a chemical, is not safe for your skin. Uh, it can cause some pretty, pretty harmful effects, even cancer. A lot of the products that we see on the market today are not for sale in many of our United States states because they're known to be uh, cancer causing agents. Uh, but no scent uh, is an enzyme formula uh, with encapsulation technology. So it's only going to uh, affect the protein signatures of humans. So without getting too gross, if it's blood, sweat, vomit, urine, feces, any of those proteins, uh, the no scent enzyme formula is going to attack and then dissolve. Uh, those proteins, hence uh, preventing them from growing bacteria, which causes the odor itself. And, you know, no scent's been around for six years and we sell globally, uh, no scent, just like treason. Um, we have another, we have a very strong presence in South Africa as well with no scent. So those are the two major lines that the apparel company and then the scent elimin elimination company um, that we have. Yeah, I know um, way back, probably, um, well, close to 20 years ago now, when I had my store, I, I got a chemist from uh, Berkeley. They work, you know, like in the fishing bait and stuff. He come up with something called Descent. And it wasn't the normal charcoal and all that stuff. It, it actually chemically altered it somehow. And yeah. he was doing that until it got so big, you know, with Berkeley's knowledge. And then he got so big and they said, well, you can be a chemist or you can have this product. So he closed it up, but that was yeah. a really good product. And one of the things I mean, take a marker and put on paper and spray it and then set this. Yeah. You can eliminate human, human odor. I mean, as we know in the hunting industry, it's, it's, it's extremely important, right? It's the number one defense mechanism that um, big game have um, deer, hogs, any type of um, animal that is a, you know, is could be victim of predation. Um, they have a very keen sense of smell. And there's two ways really to address human odor. You can eliminate it with chemicals or you can eliminate it with enzymes. And that's pretty much it. 
Um, you might be able to eliminate it with ozone. Um, there are some pretty harsh side effects to the ozone uh, product because of its corrosive nature. Um, and, you know, those are our options for us. Uh, unfortunately, the chemicals have some really negative side effects to them and um, can be harmful to your health permanently. So, you know, us and Dead Downwind are the only enzymatic products on the market right now. And Dead Downwind is a fine product. It's a great product. Uh, they will eliminate some of many odors and that's their formula. We designed our formula, formula to eliminate one, all of one odor, which is human. And uh, there isn't a human odor that no scent will not eliminate. Can it eliminate all odors 100%? Well, we don't live in a perfect world. Everybody knows that. Right. We say that it eliminates 100% of human odor. By that, we mean all of human odor. Um, not, um, you know, 100% of, of all the odor. It'll do like 99.9%. But there isn't a human odor that it won't eliminate. And a protein signature uh, from an animal is very similar to human. So for instance, like a skunk, which is one of the most pungent odors that we know of, no scent will take out uh, skunk odor uh, in about 40 seconds. And if you have a dog or if you yourself have been hit by a skunk, no scent is really what you need. Oh, that's that's interesting because, you know, you always hear all the stories, OK, you know, washing tomato soup and all this kind of stuff. And it just doesn't go away. And yeah. That's, the trouble. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, the the biggest challenge for uh, in the hunting industry, you got to you got to wade through the smoke and mirrors of a lot of products, you know, the snake oils out there. And there's a bunch out there. I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. This is why I developed no scent is because there wasn't anything that I found that worked because it couldn't work. It was just smoke and mirrors really or right. it was a cover scent the reality is and i may upset some of your listeners but the the facts are you can't cover a human odor you you can add another odor to it but it's never going to cover your human odor um regardless of what your best friend or your great grandfather said you just can't cover human odor uh you have to eliminate it and you can do that with chemicals or you can do it with enzymes. And that's pretty much the options that you have um, safely. The safest op option is really the enzyme option. Uh, only us and dead downwind are the products that can be, that are skin safe. A certified skin safe. Because you're not putting chemicals on to try and eliminate the odors. You're, you're right. actually chemically altering it. Right. We're not chemically altering anything. I mean, the, you know, enzymes are, you know, they're all natural. We have enzymes in us. It helps us digest our food so quickly. Right. Uh, if you are, you know, you might live uh, out outside of the city or whatever, and you have a septic tank, it, septic tanks run off of enzymes. That's how they break down the, you know, protein matter, you know, enzymes, uh, right. enzymes can, be formulated to break down almost anything on the planet. They can break down oil, they can make petroleums, they can break down almost anything if you formulate them correctly. Uh, and these are formulated to specifically um, attack human protein signatures. And wh why is that important is because if you're gonna spray this stuff all over you, you're probably gonna get it um, on your optics maybe, your glass, you might get it on your bow strings or your synthetic stocks. Um, and that if it's not specific to just protein, human protein, it's going to start degrading those products as well. Like, you know, the elastic, if you're it, almost all fabric has some type of elastic to it, that's a petroleum product. And it would degrade that product if it wasn't specific to just human protein um, or the coating on your optics or your bowstrings, which are made from synthetic, um, you could compromise those very delicate features of your hunting equipment with a chemical. Yeah, and, and the last thing you want to do is put anything on your bowstring and 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 be at full draw, and all of a sudden your bow comes apart on you. 
Right. I mean, it would, it would, I mean, that's the extreme catastrophe, but really it would just degrade it. So it wasn't at full strength. It would not be precise, that sort of thing. Um, like our company treason, well, Zen apparel and treason uh, camo, like our competitors, um, all the, the camo companies, Sitka, First Light, Kuyu, the larger technical fabric companies like, like treason, you know, we, we have to specifically say, if you use certain products on our clothing, it voids the warranty because they're going to be breaking down the elastic waste. Our waistbands have silicone in them. You know, the logos that are on our products are made, you know, like uh, they're uh, a silicone logo. It'll break that down. Um, it can erode stitching, all kinds of stuff. So if it's a chemical or an ozone, it will void the warranty on almost any, you know, technical clothing manufacturer like us. Uh, we're not the only ones that, that, you know, have that exemption to our warranty. But if you use those products, it is going to break down the products and it'll compromise their integrity. So then what would you recommend for washing those type of clothes in? Uh, no scent um, laundry pods. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So no scent laundry pods. Um, you know, there's no dyes and no fragrances in them. There's no UV brighteners in our laundry pods, which is really important. You don't want UV brighteners in your hunting clothes because it, we know from um, our labs, Georgia Deer Lab, the Alabama Auburn Deer Lab, that the way deer see, uh, they can actually, um, the UV rays, they can see into that light spectrum. So it gives off kind of a glow when we have UV brighteners on our clothes. Kind of like a, a black light, shine a black light on your clothes. If it glows, exactly. You it's the same thing. I mean, and unfortunately, it all has to do with the, with the quality of the clothing. Um, and if you're buying clothes that are less expensive, they're probably not using, they're using ink with UV brighteners in them, or they're using fabrics with UV brighteners in them. Um, we don't use those fabrics and we don't use those inks when we make our camo, you know, clothing. Um and a lot of companies don't either, but they're all the high-end companies. But if you're buying, you know, value-based, you know, hunting clothes, um, that's going to be a challenge for you because they're going to be made with UV brightened fabric and UV brightened uh, inks. And that's going to give you away in the, in the woods. And if you wash your hunting clothes in your normal, you know, laundry detergent, uh, you're going to have UV brighteners in there. And then you dry them in the same dryer that you had a uh, dryer sheet in with your other clothes, you're going to have fragrances on you that the deer are just going to pick up. Now, a deer's nose is a thousand times keener than a human's nose, right? It's a hundred times keener than a dog's nose. But go back to a human, it's a thousand times keener than a human's nose, a human can detect a fragrance within one meter. When it gets within one meter, we can smell whatever it is we're smelling. A deer's nose is a thousand times keener than that. So it means a deer can smell you at a thousand yards. And you've been busted by deer that you've never seen before. You'd <laughs> never see them and they're, they're gone, you know? So, you know, that's why scent elimination is so very important. Now, again, we don't live in a perfect world. You can't eliminate 100% of anything, right? It's just, an, uh, perfection is an impossibility. So, you know, but this comes very close to that. There isn't a human odor that no scent won't eliminate and it will eliminate as much of that odor as scientifically possible. Uh, just that reality because of the enzymes, the way they work. Um, and that's really important as you're going after, I mean, we, we talk to people all the time and, you know, it doesn't take a lot to kill a two and a half year old deer, one and a half year old deer, you know, they're, they're kind of dumb as a sack of hammers, um, especially during the rut. It's not that big a deal, but you want to get that five and a half, that six and a half year old deer you're going to have to 
do something, you know, to improve your game, like, you know, have no scent. Uh, and then also have a camo pattern that, and a camo product like Treason, that's going to give you that performance, which will break up your silhouette, that will fit you properly, because if it doesn't fit properly, you're going to be uncomfortable. And if you're uncomfortable, you're moving. And if you're moving, it's over, you know? They yeah. look for movement. So that's why we try to make our clothes, our, our camo, you know, fit perfectly. It's got to be comfortable. It's got to be quiet. You know, if, if you're cold or you're wet, you're more likely to be moving or shivering or something like that. So we try to build, that's why we build into our clothes, the technology that we do to give you the best opportunity on the best animal possible. Otherwise, you're just going to be shooting two and a half year old deer, and you know the genetics are going to be watered down because you're you're taking out those deer before they can put their genetics fully into the gene pool. Um, you want to take those those older animals just for a, a genetics um, perspective. I don't have any problem with someone shooting a legal deer. I don't care how old it is. If it's a legal deer and it makes you happy, I'm happy for you. Uh, but if if you are looking to, you know, strengthen your herd or manage the, the herd, you really want to let those younger good bucks put their genes in the gene pool, take out the older bucks that have already put their genes in the gene pool, and you'll have a healthier herd. Yeah, that, that's that's true. There's there's some areas that you might you might as well shoot it because it's not going to make it through rifle season. You know that it, it some places just really do it. I know we had one guy one time, and, and also being a public property was private property, and then one one day they come in and wiped out all the herd, and you know years later, and they're still they haven't recovered. You, you know, yeah. So, I mean, um, it's 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 a very delicate ecosystem. Um, you know, I consider myself a hunter, obviously, but I also consider myself a conservationist. And conservation is extremely important to me for a lot of reasons. But if you're going to manage the ecosystem, that's why here in Georgia, if I see a hog, I kill a hog, you know, because it doesn't belong in my ecosystem. It takes out the turkeys and all the ground nesting birds. It'll eat a fawn. Hogs are horrible. They don't, they were never indigenous to our, our population here. So we see a hog, we shoot a hog. But for deer, you know, we want a healthy herd. And yeah, it's it's always good if you can meet with your neighbors. We live on a 200 acre property here in East Georgia. And my neighbors have 300 acres, 600 acres and 1200 acres. And we work together with each other to identify the bucks that we think are, you know, shooters for the season that's coming up. And it's worked out pretty well over the last few years. And now we have, you know, good mature bucks. Now, you know, hey, if your if your grandson or somebody else, you know, that had never shot a deer before comes in and you see a nice two and a half year old and you want to take him and it's all legal, then, you know, I'm not going to judge anybody for doing that. Um, but it's always best if you can, you know, give those animals some years to put their genes in the gene pool and, you know, take out a healthy number of does because if you get an unhealthy doe to buck population, uh, the bucks become weak and uh, small and they're more vulnerable to disease uh, because they're weak. But if they have to compete for those does because there's fewer of the does, it makes them strong and uh, gives you a healthier population all around. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's all about conservation and giving yourself the best shot opportunity. So you don't have to take a risky shot. You can take the best shot on the best animal. Uh, if you give yourself, you know, the better opportunities, that's why, you know, if you're a bow hunter, um, you really want good equipment so that it'll perform well. If you're a rifle hunter, uh, again, you want to you want a good trusted round 
You want good optics. You want to be able to put a, a good ethical shot on the animal. You want to give yourself all the opportunities you can to take the best shot on the best animal. And quite, and that's what no scent does. And, and that's what treason helps you do as well. Yeah. You just, you know, like you kind of alluded to, uh, you need to know your equipment. Yeah. You know, okay. With my bow, what is my effective range that I feel comfortable shooting? Now it was longer, but as I get older, I don't see as well. <laughs> so my pencil are more blurry. So my max distance I'm going to shoot is is not going to be as long as what it was before. But, you know, all the time I've been shooting, my first year was 40 yards. I've shot a couple of 20. The rest have been 10 or less. So, yeah. I, I, <laughs> you know. I mean, do you use a verifier? No, I don't. Man, I'm telling you, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how old you are, but I'm old enough that I need reading glasses, right? <laughs> so, the verifier is a and it and it's not legal. In, I, I have so glasses for for the computer, and I have glasses for regular seeing, and they're uh, under bifocals, uh, and, and these are also bifocals for reading. So. <laughs> I understand, man. You can get a verifier in your prescription in your peep site, which is like the greatest thing ever. Um, and I use a verifier um, now. If I go to some states. And the, the, the laws change usually yearly. You just got to look at what the law says in your state, whether you can use a, an optic like that. Because in some states, you can't. You can't use any type of optics uh, on your bow. But uh, where you can, you know, again, it's about getting the best ethical shot. Now, for me, uh, you know, I can hit a target at 40 yards pretty consistently. But I'm I'm still... I'm not comfortable shooting, you know, beyond 30 yards. Um, and that's just me, you know, and most of the time, quite honestly, I'm, I don't need to, if I'm hunting in the woods, you know, most of my shots are, you know, 20, 25 yards. Yeah. Like I said, I try to set up for 20 yard shots, but they always come in closer. <laughs> you know, I, I've shot them at five feet. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I, I shoot them at, at five yards, uh, you know, sometimes 10 yards. And if I'm lucky, they're, they're out to 15. Um, you know, I've had them basically walking almost underneath my tree stand. And, you, you know, you just, that's too close. You know, I don't want them that close. I want them further away because that angle is just such a crazy angle that yeah, you don't, you don't have a good, you know, clean shot to go through. And yeah, I like a little yeah. bit longer shots, but. Yeah. Yeah. The, the same thing, you know, you need to know how your equipment shoots. You know, how does it shoot at 20 yards? How does it shoot at 10 yards? How does it shoot at five yards? What what happens if you get one at five feet? How do you shoot at five feet? You need to know how that sight works. Because if you're at five feet and you put your pin where you want it to go, you're missing. You're way low. And a lot of people don't understand this. Like, the really close ones, you got to use your long range pins. And, you know, I've explained this a couple of times, but your eyes and your sight is at one level. Your arrow is actually lower. That's why in a blind, a lot of people shoot through their blind because they're not realizing that, oh, my pin, my pin clears, but no, the arrow don't. Uh, same thing right. with rifles. You need to know how your rifle is set up. What's it going to do at 25 yards? What's going to do at 100, 200, 300? Um, you know, I have mine set up where I'm dead on at 20, 26 yards and 200 yards. Um, I'm about an inch something high at hundred, about three something low at 300. So I know on that, I put that pin where I, or the, the scope where I want it to go and squeeze up. I'm good. Uh, same thing with the bow. You know, I know my 20 yard pin at 10 yards, not enough difference to worry about. You know, start getting closer. You know, I can use that 20 yard pin, you know, anywhere from about 10 yards to 25 yards and be just fine. You know, out to 30, I'll, I'll need to move up to no because I'll be kind of low. But lots of times they, they drop down low when they hear the bow go off. So you never know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's uh, um, there, there, there's a lot to doing that. You know, when I first started, there was uh, the, the tree bark camo, which, Part of that pattern in yours kind of reminded me of the tree bark. 
Well, I think um, the, the tree bark was like one of the first camo, um, non-military camos that came right. out. And it was it was effective at a level. I mean, uh, it, was, it was actually not bad at all. The, um, you know, the thing about camo patterns um, for the deer, um, what you really want is something to break up your silhouette, right? right. I mean, it's really what you're going after. Um, so one of the one of the mistakes that I think are made with some camo patterns is they have such a small repeating pattern that at 25 to 50 yards, you look like a solid, you know? Right. And that's exactly what you don't want. You don't want your silhouette your silhouette to be solid. Um, like the image on your, your screen behind you, you've got a silhouette of a bow hunter and a deer. You can see them clearly, right? right. But I mean, if you had their, their, their silhouette broken up by the pattern of the sky, it'd be very difficult to see them. And that's what we do with treason. Um, our patterns have larger islands of imagery. And in those islands of imagery, there's different colors and different textures. Um, and that's going to break up the pattern quite effectively. We use um, both dark colors and light colors in our patterns because you see that in the woods, especially when you're looking up from the ground into a tree like a deer is. I mean, you, you don't want to have a camel pattern that looks like dirt unless you're sitting on the dirt you know what when a when a deer is looking up you know in the tree line because he may know that that tree stand that ladder stand has a could have a hunter in it you know you gotta you gotta pattern yourself for what's behind you which is sky sometimes and leaves so like in early season we have you know a really i'll show you if i can um our early season uh, pattern. I'll pull out our pants and uh, see if I can make it bigger. Here we go. Can I share my screen again? Yeah, you can share. Okay. So, so this is this is a picture of our early season cargo pants, right? And you can see there's islands that are light colors. And then there's patterns that are darker greens and then some brighter greens in here, even some rust or dirt colored patterns as well. And that's what you see when you look into the woods. You see bright greens, you see dark greens, and you see some light colors and you see some dark colors. That's super important as you're, you're looking to break up you know, your silhouette. Um, and a lot of times, especially in older patterns, you'll see, um, you know, stuff that repeats quite often. Um, and, you know, it's real small and basically it doesn't break up your pattern at all. And that's a mistake that, you know, some of the camel patterns make when they have such a small repeating um, you know, pattern because it repeats so often so quickly, um, then, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't break up, um, your silhouette like it needs to. And, and that's treason, both in the early season and the late season, uh, are specifically designed to break up your silhouette, to mimic the forest or the woods, wherever you're, you're hunting. Um, you know, that's, that's what we do. At least that's always our goal in what we do. Yeah, I know when I set up my tree stand, I, I kind of look up and, and see, okay, am I silhouetted in the sky? Because I've had deer come by and look up and it's like, oh, and then I, I realize, oh, I'm silhouetted. I'm standing out like a sore thumb, you know? So I always try to look, okay, what's behind me? Is there trees or something that gives a little bit of depth? You know, you're not seeing... You know, like you mentioned, the guy in my background, 
you know, standing there. He's silhouetted. He, obviously, you can see he's a bow hunter. You can see it's not natural. Um, now, if he was on the other side with some trees, with the trees behind him, you, you would be hard to pick him out because he's got something to break up that pattern. And, yep. you know, that would be kind of interesting to see how well, if you are skylighted in a, in a tree stand or ladder stand or wherever, how that pattern looks looking up at somebody that is actually silhouetted. Yeah. I mean, we have, um, we do some marketing like that to show exactly that, um, what that's like, because that's exactly, you know, you want to break up your silhouette usually in a, a ladder stand or a climb on or something like that, because you're going to be hanging out in the breeze and you need to have the most, you know, cover that you can so that the deer obviously can't see you. And that's, that's what our patterns do is that they, they will mimic the surroundings and therefore, you know, blend you in to uh, your background. And that that's, you know, that's what we do. So what, what got you started in archery? Well, um, I, I, I was a, I was a gun hunter at first. Um, uh, and it's, 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 it all started. Um, honestly, I grew up with my family. We hunted, uh, mostly small game like rabbits and squirrels and things like that in Illinois. Um, growing up in the late sixties, there wasn't a lot of deer in Illinois, believe it or not. So, um, we didn't hunt deer in, my family didn't. And it was kind of a sport for some, uh, for, for people who had more resources than my family. We grew up very modest and we just didn't have a lot of resources. We had a shotgun and that's it, you know? So we squirrel hunted, rabbit hunted, um, did some, some bird hunting, things like that. But, um, back in 1999, back in the, the last millennia, right? <laughs> yeah. um, back in 1999, my dad died and, uh, it was very, I, whenever a parent dies, it's always very difficult for the the child, even adult child, to process that. So one of my very good friends, uh, his name's Benji, and he, you know, he said, "Hey, you know what you need? You need to just go out behind my house and sit in the deer stand, and just kind of reset, you know, your 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 head and your heart." And I said, "Okay, that that sounds good." And I thought, well, maybe if I go you know, sit in a deer stand. Um, I might, you know, kind of reset and reconnect with my dad, at least in those experiences, that sort of thing. So I thought that'd be a good idea. So, I mean, I had my blue jeans and my sneakers on and probably a plaid shirt, some crackers, you know, Coca-Cola, <laughs> <laughs> everything, right? I, you know, I didn't do anything right, you know? But I, I got up in the tree stand and I was there for, you know, I don't know, not very long, right? And I um, man, a nice eight point buck came out and I, I was able to put a good shot on it with my 30-30 lever action, you know, Winchester Model 94 gun, you know? And good guns. <laughs> yeah, it was a great gun. Um, and, you know, I, I that gave me an opportunity to just try to you know reconnect with some of the experiences that my dad might have had, and uh, it kind of started a journey uh, for me. Um, you know, really twenty almost twenty five years ago now, twenty four years ago, and you know that's how I got into hunting. Now bow hunting, I started about four years ago, and uh, when I when I developed no scent, I thought you know this product probably is what every bow hunter needs. Now I'm not a bow hunter, but I think I want to try to bow hunt. And uh, if I have no scent to eliminate my human odor, I probably could maybe get a chance of getting them close to me enough, close enough I could shoot them. And that's why I took up bow hunting, uh, basically to prove that no scent worked. And that's how I got into bow hunting. So um, I bought... Yeah, I went to Bass Pro and bought a, you know, a beginner, you know, bow and just, you know, I'm not going to spend more than $500 on a bow. That's crazy talk, you know, and I, I went and bought something on sale and 
you know, is actually good enough. Um, no scent started to sell over in South Africa. So uh, I went over to South Africa and I have a friend who's from South Africa. So we went over there and we went, we were part of the, 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 uh, Huntex trade show, which is a big international trade show in Johannesburg. And we set up a booth for no scent and, you know, did great. I mean, everybody there just loved it. And then um, I was walking around, took a little break from the booth and walked around. And I, I saw this camo that was just amazing. And, um, and I, the more I looked at it, I go, this is not from South Africa. It can't be, this looks like American camo and it was treason. Right. So first time I ever saw treason was in South Africa. And I I came back home and I looked them up and I called some they said, man, I don't know. I, I need some of this camo. This is the best camo I've ever seen. And that's how I got into treason. But bow hunting, um, I got into bow hunting because of no scent. And that was about four years ago. And, um, you know, the rest is history. Now that's pretty much all I do is just bow hunt. Now I, I'll, I'll shoot animals with a rifle for sure. I don't really, you know, it doesn't matter to me that much, but I always prefer to bow hunt. Yeah. Bow hunting's kind of my preferred method, but you know what? I'll grab that rifle and go out there and shoot too. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's meat in the freezer and that's kind of what we want to do is, you know, yeah. Meat and yeah. Freezer. It's really good, yeah. good, good food. And, and it's amazing how, I mean, I'm looking uh, across the room um, uh, at two bows that were my dad's, right? And one of them is all it, they're what we would call traditional bows now, right? Um, because there was no compound bow back in the 60s. <laughs> or at least we didn't know about it. But my dad had a traditional wooden bow, and it's over there in the corner. And then there's a fancy bow, it's got some fiberglass on it too, you know. Uh, but that those were his bows. And I remember my dad shooting a bow and I thought, you know, this would be great. So now I have, I mean, I have those bows. They're, they're, I don't use them. I just, they're just there to remind me of my dad. And then I have, I have four, let's see, one, two, three, four, four, four other bows uh, that I shoot now. Uh, so I, I enjoy it. Um, my, I'm hopeful that this spring I'm going to take a turkey with my bow. That would be, that would be good challenging kind of small target oh yeah right and a hard target to hit right yeah but you know i think it'd be cool yeah i would i know that compounds were first developed the first ones come out in late 60s they they weren't really available to buy until the 70s mm -hmm. you know so you, you know like me i i grew up in the 50s and 60s and and you know when, when i got my first bow uh, in early sixties, my option was either wood or fiberglass, longbow or recurve. <laughs> that was and wood arrows or wood arrows with feathers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, yeah, that was the only options you had. You yeah, know? and yeah. I still have my first bow. It's a twenty-five pound fiberglass re recurve, um, Ben Pearson, and it's still got a string on it that's decades old. Um, I won't string it because you know, the fiberglass is kind of you can see little defects in it for them. And so I won't even bother stringing it because it means more to me in, in good shape than it does to shoot it, you know? Yeah. But I have another recurve, you know, a, a PSE recurve that I can shoot if I want to shoot recurves. And then I have two PSE bows and a, and a bear. Yeah. I, I mean, not up the bear yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got season coming for sure. I mean, I have, um, I've got a Darton bow that I started with and I've got a couple Martin bows because Martin puts our, puts our patterns on their bows. Um, I've got a couple Athens archery bows because they put their patterns, our patterns on their bows. Um, I've shot a Matthews. Love it. I mean, every bow is slightly different. I mean, I have my preferences, but honestly, the 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 bows that I have, they're so good. They're better bows than I am a bow shooter, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are really good. 
Um, now these are all flagship bows. I mean, these are the top end bows by all those companies and manufacturers. Um, they shoot amazingly well. Uh, they're, they shoot better than I do. So, um, you know, they're just, they're just incredible. And you can, you can pretty much find the bow that just kind of fits you. It's almost like, you know, Harry Potter in the, the uh the wand store i forgot the name of the oh, store yeah uh, i forget now but yeah i yeah. remember that story yeah. yeah so he's got to go in there right and the and the wand picks the the wizard right yeah uh, and it's kind of like that with a bow for me it's like you'll know it when you put it in your hands and you shoot it you'll know what bow is has picked you you know kind of a thing uh just fits you you know better than other bows yeah, I know that's why I tell beginners is like, okay, if you're going to shoot a right-handed bow or a left-handed bow, grab everyone that you can afford. You know, don't go out and look at the the two thousand dollar bow if your budget's you know five hundred bucks. But uh, grab the bow, put it in your hand. If you don't like what it feels, put it back up. Next, you know, yeah. you're going to get one. It's like, oh, that feels good in my hand, and yeah. then set it up to your draw length and shoot it and see what you think. Yeah. And then grab another one that feels good, set it up, shoot it. You know, make them about the same, the same draw length, the same weight, because you're not, you know, if you get one that's set at 60 pounds, one that's set at 70 pounds, they're going to feel different. You can't compare them. So whenever I was setting them up, people, it's like same draw length, same draw weight. So the only difference was the feel of the bow. And, you know, you go through the field, see what it's like. And sometimes you have to get down. It's like, uh, shoot with your eyes closed. I'm going to hand you a bow. You're going to shoot it with your eyes closed. So you don't know which one it is. So you can't be biased that way. And then shoot bow one, shoot bow two. Which one you like better and why? You know, I don't care the why. I just want them to say why. You know, and it's okay. So pull that one out. And, you know, if you have another bow, shoot these two. Which one you like better? And, and then pick a bow. You know, that's one way to, to do it. Because now you know how it feels. With your eyes closed, you're, with your eyes open, your mind gets confused. You know, you can get that bias in there. It's like, well, I think this is the best bow. I want this bow. And then your mind won't let you actually feel that this other bow is better, much better bow for you. And, you know, that's just something you, you got to do. And if you go to a place that knows what they're doing, that's what they're going to do for you is, you know, set them up and try them. And, you know, when I had my shop or when I was working at either, I worked at both Bass Pro and Cabela's, like, Shoot them. You can shoot every bow in the store if you want. Some you're not going to be able to because they're shooting with the wrong hand, but still. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just got to find the bow that, you know, fits you. And that's that's the whole key to, you know, any of this, no matter what sport you're doing, the equipment's got to fit you. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's just like our yeah, like, or whatever. Yeah. I, and, and that's the thing is that you need to be comfortable with your equipment and your equipment needs to be good enough quality that you can be comfortable. I mean, there's some, there's some camo out there that is never going to fit anybody. Um, it's just cheap China, you know, stuff coming over here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for bow hunting, you know, treason offers what we call our ultralight product. And it's the lightest weight hunting pant on the market. It's 1.8 pounds. That's it. Uh, 1.8 pounds. And that's a four-way flex fabric. It's got uh, vents in the knees and the hips that you can open and close. And then the fabric around the back yoke of the pant, like where your belt is, that's a ventilated fabric. And then that same fabric is in the crotch area that's ventilated. The entire pant of the ultralight product is made to port out your heat so that you can stay comfortable. Um, and then we have ultralight shirts um, and all kinds of products because here in the Southeast, even, I mean, I, I've hunted opening day of Kentucky for the last four years. And it's not been under 90 degrees any year, opening day in Kentucky. Here in Georgia, it's definitely not going to be under 90 degrees. It's be 95 degrees. Alabama, Florida, you know, 
any of these states, um, it's going to be hot a lot of times for opening day. And most camo is built for keep you warm, you know, when it's 50 degrees or colder, you know. And if you wear that same camo bow hunting opening day, you're going to die. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we just say, look, if you use our ultralight product, bow hunting opening day in Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, all the Southern states, even Kentucky, it's miserable, right? Let's just be honest. It's, it's hot. It's 95 degrees. You, it's miserable, but you will be less miserable in our camo <laughs> because it's going to keep you cool. Um, and if, it can keep you cool. You can stay out longer and you might have a better opportunity. So that's really important. Of course, no scent is extremely important on those hot days. Spray down because you're going to be sweating. And if you're sweating, you're creating bacteria. If you're creating bacteria, you're creating odor. So, you know, especially opening day, because I mean, we all want to shoot opening day. The bucks are easier to pattern. That time of year, they're still in velvet, maybe, you know, depending on the state you're in. So it's really important to hunt opening day. We, we've we been living all year uh, for it. And now when it finally comes, sep or first September, or even August in some states, um, man, you better be ready. You better have some good, you know, lightweight, warm weather hunting clothing, like no sense, or excuse me, like treasons. Um, you know, ultralight product, very important. It, and and that's you know here in Nebraska, you know, we still have in September, September when the hunting season starts, it's still fairly warm, and we can have those hot days like that. And you know, then we get later in the season. Now, then we don't want that lightweight. We want you know right. something you know that'll keep us warm. And you know, like yeah. that that one, you know down to what 20 degrees with just a t-shirt underneath the shirt yeah yeah i mean these performance fabrics are just amazing like um like you take our cargo pants or our jacket and it's it's not very heavy but it's three layers of, of fabric um an outside soft shell fabric then there's a tpu layer membrane that will keep the wind and the water out and then a a, a fleece a hex fleece lining which promotes breathability and really uh, secures the warmth of your own body back, you know, close to your body. I mean, uh, they're not ex exceptionally bag um, bulky um, clothes. They're not heavy, but they will keep you warm and dry. And, you know, if you can, you know, windproof is, is, is usually more important than waterproof because the difference between waterproof and water resistant, right? waterproof is a raincoat i mean that's like turn a fire ho hose on you and you don't get wet um the the issue is if it's raining that hard a you may not want to be out there and b the deer may not be moving if it's raining that hard um but water repellent that's your no that's your light rain that's your moderate rain Deer will move in that. They don't care as long as it's not lightning where there's a lot of wind. Uh, so water repellent or water resistant, which is the same thing, um, is really important. And then wind proof is probably most important because if it's if it's 40 degrees and you got a, a 10 uh, a, a, a humid 10 mile an hour wind, you could freeze. You'd you'd feel it feel like it's zero out. So our products, both our late season jacket and late season cargo pants, all have that TPU layer in them, which makes them windproof, not only water resistant or water repellent, but also but windproof. And that keeps you a lot warmer when it, the wind is not cutting through you. Yeah, I know uh, fleece is real nice and warm until you get wind. Or until you get wet. <laughs> yeah or or, or until wet. you have to walk through a briar or burr patch you know oh, yeah <laughs> fleeces fleece is great because it's quiet right? right and it's really good at trapping your human warmth right but if you've ever hunted in a pure fleece jacket or pants and it's raining 
you're miserable. And if you have to get down and walk through some briars or some, some, you know, stickers, oh, it's the worst. Um, every fabric has its pros and its cons to it. You know, there are benefits and there are liabilities to fabrics. And the, the key is to find kind of the right balance for where you are. Um, I, th I, I was going to go hunting. I've been hunting in Colorado probably 20 years in a row, elk hunting in the high mountains. And one year I thought, you know, this, this fleece jacket is exactly what I need, man. I'm going to be so warm at those altitudes. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and it was until it started to snow. And man, it got heavy <laughs> and it got wet. And then I got cold and that was not fun at all. No. Um, so, I mean, you, every, I mean, fleece is great, um, but it has some draw, it has some liabilities to it as well. It's very quiet, but man, you, it, once it gets wet, it's, it's not, not nearly the performance out of the fabrics. And if you ever have to walk through briars or, or, you know, any type of stickers, um, that's it's like, the worst. <laughs> that's the worst, you know, you want, you want a, um, you know, a tight weave, you know, something that's going to repel water, repel the, the briars and that, and yet, you know, still be quiet. And that's really always the challenge is waterproofing usually means louder. And that's always the, the, the give and take, you know, is it waterproof? Yes. Is it quiet? Not as much as you'd want, because to waterproof something usually means it's going to have to be louder. Now, the more expensive the fabrics, the more technical the fabrics, the quieter you can get the waterproof fabrics, but still they're going to be louder than like fleece, which is not waterproof at all. You know, so you're, there's a give and a take in the whole waterproofing. Yes, you can have totally waterproof, but it's going to be louder than you might want. So how important is the waterproofing to you? If it's really important and you don't move a lot, then maybe you're okay. But uh, most people would like something that gives them a good level of waterproofing and a good level of quiet. And that's that sweet spot where you want to be. And usually a soft shell product uh, fabric like what we use, Kuyu, Sitka, um, First Light, all use similar fabrics. Um, that's that high end technical fabric that's very quiet and yet waterproof. Uh, but you get lower, less expensive fabrics, you'll you'll get them loud or they'll just be fleece and they won't be waterproof at all. Yeah, good good information to keep in mind when you're looking for clothes. You know, I've got yeah. drawers and drawers and hangers and hangers full of, of clothes and, uh, you know, camel clothes. And I don't wear too many of them anymore. But, uh, you know, when it gets colder than I can put on my, uh, I don't remember if it's scent blocker or scent lock. I think it's scent lock suit you know, which helps with the descent control. Um, I The first time I even had an experience with anything like that, it was it was uh, early season and we hunted the morning, hunted, so we went out the afternoon and it was hot. So I put on a t-shirt and my shorts and put on, uh, had one of the, the British chem suits, you know, not real thick, but it was a charcoal suit, you know, designed for keeping chemicals to get into your body. And so I put that on and I'm sitting out there and I'm sweating all afternoon. You know, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm soaking wet and I go to, cause it's a, a pullover. I go to pull it off and I figure it's going to stink inside as I'm pulling it off. It smelled like distilled water. Didn't have any smell at all. It's like, Oh, that does really work pretty good. Mm. You know, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's always a challenge um, to, to find that balance. Right. But yeah, I mean, Layering is real important. And today with the fabrics that we have available to us, you can get, you know, lightweight, not bulky, you know, high performance fabrics uh, that are going to keep you dry, going to keep you warm, going to keep you comfortable, going to keep you in the woods longer. I mean, that's the whole thing. But right. they come to price, right? And uh, because those those fabrics, that's not just plain cotton, you know. Uh, so there's technology in that, and that that is usually more expensive than just plain cotton. So it's always a trade-off of what you're going to get. And 
you know, we get we get asked all the time about where's your product manufactured, you know, because that's important to us in this day and age, right? And the reality is that the fabrics we use, um, they are not made in the United States. Nobody makes them in the United States. It's not even an option. They can the machines that cut these fabrics are very special machines. They're not in the United States either. So to get windproof, waterproof, quiet, breathable, antimicrobial for your scent control stuff, I mean, to get that fabric, you're very limited on your options. And yeah. you, there are no options in the United States. Plus, I mean, this, this quarter zip I have on, um, this is a merino wool quarter zip, right? And uh, you can't get this fabric you know, in the United States, this is made overseas um, because it's the only place they make it. And if like this, this, I think, you know, this product sells for around 115 bucks, you know, something like that. Lifetime guarantee, lifetime warranty on all the zippers and everything else. It's, it's, you know, I won't have to replace this. Right. Um but if I had to make this in the United States, if my company had to, was making this in the United States, I'd, I'd probably have to charge $350 for this because of the cost of labor. And, you know, that's the trade-off. I mean, we would, we would love, love, love to make our products in the United States. But the, the fabric options to us are not available here. And the labor costs are, you know, so expensive. So... You know, we we make our products all over the world. Depends on the product where it's made. So, uh, you know, whether it's merino wool or if it's if it's a TPU layer fabric or if it's a micro fleece, if it's a hat, um, you know, just depends on what the product is, where it's made. Almost all hats are made in Bangladesh and Vietnam. Those are the two pl places that manufacture. Like ninety nine percent of the hats are all made in the same place. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. I know um, I have some merino wool uh, socks, and you know I, I have you know I had a whole drawer full, you know, several you know a dresser, you know, full drawer full of of wool socks. And what do I wear? Those merino wool ones. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, um, the, the other thing, warm, and you don't have to get layers and layers and layers of socks. Right. And the other thing is, like, if it's elastic, it's it's not from the United States. That. A lot of times companies will, I'm not saying they're being untruthful, but they may be bending the truth a little bit by saying made in America, because the while the they may be sewn here, the components all come from overseas. You know, zippers, elastics, snaps, any of that stuff is, is coming from overseas. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like saying that this, you know, pick a foreign car like Hyundai or something like that. It's like made in America. It's like, well, it was assembled here, you know, <laughs> but it certainly wasn't made here. Um, but we live in a, we live in a global society right now. And, um, you know, we, we are an American owned company, treason and no scent. No scent is 100% made in America. Um, the bottles, even our plastic bottles are made right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but it's so difficult to, you know, compete in a, a world market. Um, you know, it, it's just, I wish everything was made in America, but those options just aren't available uh, to us. And that's, that's a shame actually. Yeah, it is, but uh, you've got to go with, you know, where you're going to get the best product to produce the, the best product. You know, your, your materials have to be high quality because you're putting out high quality, you know, clothing and, and equipment and you, you just got to find the best. And if it's yeah. manufactured here, then that's a bonus. Yeah. I mean, I wish, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I have very strong views about our, you know, country and, and I'm a huge patriot. Um, but I think you also have to be somewhat of a realist. I mean, we do get people that are, you know, not happy because our products aren't all made in the United States, but they're texting me on their phone, which wasn't made here or on their computer that wasn't made here. The car <laughs> they drove, you know, everything they got on their body wasn't made here either, you know, <laughs> and it, there's a sense of duplicity in that. 
where you go, I get it, but man, you don't live in that world and neither do we. Um, that's just not the world we, we, we live in anymore. So we do the very best we can uh, with our American owned company and you know, provide the very best products at a very affordable price. We are usually one third less than some of those other major brands that I've just mentioned uh, in price. So we say, look, if you uh, have, if you work 40 hours a week, you can, you can afford, you know, our products. Um, our, our products are in your price range. If you work 40 hours a week. Now, if you don't work 40 hours a week, you probably can't, nor should try to buy my, my products. Um, you should, you know, try to work 40 hours a week and, <laughs> yeah. and then you, maybe you can, but you know, we, we offer a very competitive products at a very competitive price. Um, our products are, you know, quality for quality, every bit as good as the other products that are uh, companies that I've just mentioned. Um, we don't have the name brand. We don't have the brand recognition of those guys, but we do have the quality and the performance of those guys. Plus, I mean, we do, we have great customer service. We ship same day on all of our products. You place an order before 2 p.m. and it's going to go out that day except on Saturdays and Sundays, right? <laughs> People yeah. are like, yeah, we get all the time. It's like, hey, have you shipped my product yet? It's like, well, you ordered it, you know, 1130 Saturday night and it's Sunday afternoon. <laughs> no, I haven't. We haven't shipped your product yet. It'll get shipped Monday morning. So you don't ship on Saturday and Sundays. <laughs> no, we don't because nobody takes product. It's like UPS, FedEx, you know, they don't, they don't, those commercial accounts that we have, they don't, they don't come on those days. So, um, but I mean, we do the very best we can. And, and usually, you know, you're going to get your product within two to four days, depends on um, where you live, like not in the United States, but like, if you live closer to a metro area, you'll get them sooner. But if you live, if you, if you live in the middle of nowhere, and then you take a dirt road five more miles, you know, it might, it might, it might take four days. Um, but if you live in a normal, if you live near a city, you probably have your products in two days. You know, if you ordered on Monday, you're going to have it on Wednesday because we'll ship it Monday and you'll probably get it Wednesday. Um, but you have to provide us with the actual address, the correct address. And if you don't, uh, That's true. <laughs> you know, it's like, we get, we have some great, you know, we talk to people all the time. It's like, Hey, I never got my product. Oh man, let me look at that. Yeah. Well, UPS says it delivered and like to the address you gave us. Yeah. But that's my neighbor's house. Y yeah. Well, that's the address you gave us. <laughs> so <laughs> it, go talk to your neighbor and see if they have your product. Yeah. Um, but there's all kinds of amazing stories, um, you know, in terms of shipping, um, that are just, you can't make this stuff up kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know um, I ordered a, a, a torque wrench from a place down in Kansas city and I placed the order in the morning and, you know, they give an option, you know, two day delivery, you know, so the normal delivery, it's like, I, I never take those because that's just a whole lot of extra money. And, you know, I had product next night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nobody, by the way, guarantees two day delivery. Uh, people ask us all that you offer two day delivery. We say no, because that's not a thing. Uh, UPS will not. I mean, they can, they'll sell you something that they call that, but it's not really what you and I would call two days and they don't guarantee it either. So you can pay extra money for two day delivery, but there's no guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, why am I doing this? Right. I, um, I, I've seen sometimes the two day delivery time was longer than the normal delivery. It can be. Um, I mean, usually you're fine with UPS or USPS. Um, I mean, usually two, two days, three days, you know, we have people that order stuff and like I said, in Hawaii, um, or in Canada, we ship all over the world and it's going to take just a little longer, right. To yeah. get there, but not much. I mean, and it depends on when you order it. Look, if you order something December 20th, you know, I'm not sure you're going to get it before you know christmas because christmas is on a monday 
and the 24th and the 23rd is a you know Sunday and a Saturday. So you're not going <laughs> to, it's not going to happen. Um, but I mean, usually it's two to three days. Yeah, I know that's, um, I used to, when I had, had my store, I used to order martial arts equipment from uh, Pennsylvania at a place and, I, and it was four days. It's always just four days to get here from Pennsylvania to Nebraska. It was always four days. Every, no matter when I ordered it, it was four business days. You know, if I on Friday, well, it was four business days or on Monday, it's yeah. still four business days. Yeah. I mean, it, they've gotten better, really. Um, I mean, we ship we ship all over the United, you know, the lower 48 and it's usually two to three days. Doesn't matter yeah. where it is, unless you're out in the middle of nowhere. And then it could take a little longer. But it's because you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's got to go to certain distribution centers and then to another distribution center until and then to your Uncle Bob. And then he's got to give it to your Aunt Ma Mabel and then she's going to hand it to you. You know, it's going to be like that, right? Well, I know stuff coming from Kansas City, you know, once they deliver it to, to FedEx um, or, or whoever, a lot of my stuff comes in FedEx, but um, they, they go to the distribution center in FedEx and then it gets shipped over to Omaha. And then it gets shipped down to Lincoln and then it gets put on a truck to be delivered here. Cause I'll leave it between Omaha and Lincoln. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's the world we live in. Right. But it all happens in two, three days. You know, yeah. as, as the one I was, I was watching it, it's like, okay, I ordered early enough the day they, they put it out that day to the distribution center. And I seen that it was transferred from the receiver place to the distribution center in Kansas city. And then uh, at night, it was sent up to Omaha at their distribution center. And then uh, by the morning, it was sent out to Lincoln, to their distribution center, and then loaded on a truck that morning to be delivered <laughs> sometime that day. You know, it's amazing how they day. get back at all. But they do. They do. You know, it's, you know, when I had my stories like 20 years ago, so shipping wasn't near as efficient as it is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's that that's cool. So um you've been over to Africa to hunt. Tell mm -hmm. us about some of your hunts over there. Yeah, so I've been, I think, eight times now um to hunt South Africa. And I I um I lead trips to South Africa. I've got three trips coming up this year. And you know, if if people are interested in hunting South Africa. Um, they can certainly, you know, message me and we can chat through what that looks like. And we have spots open for people to go. It's uh, it's not a value hunt economically, but you do good, good value for your for your dollar over there. So, um, you know, people ask all the time, it's like, what's it like? How much does it cost? And all those kinds of things. Um, well, it's it's not like anything in the United States. And. Um, it's, it's about the cost of a trophy animal here in the United States. So let's say you, you want to kill, uh, five trophy grade animals, right? Not, not just good animals, but, but, uh, SCI gold medal animals, trophies, true trophies measured by SCI or in South Africa, it's, it's, uh, Roland Ward. Um, it, it, for that, you're going to spend about eight to nine thousand dollars. Depends on the type of animal that you're going to shoot. Um, but that's five trophy animals. You know, that's that's less than a trophy elk hunt here in the United States. If you could get a tag, right? Um, but for you know to to hunt South Africa, I mean, it's really quite a beautiful experience. Um, you get on a plane in Atlanta. Somehow you get to Atlanta. I would always recommend this flight pattern. Fly to direct flight, flight from Atlanta to Johannesburg. And then the our, our guide and um, outfitter picks us up from the airport, takes us to the farm, which could be, depends on the farm, either, you know, three to four hours away. And um, man, you could be hunting that same day, um, which is amazing. Um, now there are some farms that are set up for bow hunting and some that are set up for rifle hunting and some farms are set up for both. And you don't hunt rifle hunt where you bow hunt. 
I mean, that's, that's, you'd never see any animals if you did that. So uh, different, different types of hunting um, depends on if you're a rifle hunter or a bow hunter. Um, but, you know, you go to these um, hunt farms and they're really, most of them are like five-star resorts. I'm not kidding. They're just spectacular, you know, um, wonderful food, like exquisite food. You'll usually have an onboard chef that's going to prepare your meals for you. And you've got a laundry service every day. So, I mean, we tell people all the time, look, you're going to be gone for 10 days. Bring like five pairs of underwear, five pairs of socks. Do not bring 12 of everything, right? Because they're going to do your laundry every day. Um, you're not going to need all those clothes. Um, so they have a laundry service and exquisite food. The the bed, the lodging is just magnificent. It's like a five-star resort. I mean, usually they've got swimming pools and all kinds of really amazing stuff. It's not, you know, it's not difficult in that respect. I mean, it's very comfort. It is, it's, it's very comfortable, right? Um, but when you go out hunting, um, you'll hunt out of what they call a hide, which is what you we call a blind, right? And oftentimes the hide is subterranean. So half of the hide is below um, grade. So if you're bow hunting, you're, you got to get prepared to shoot from ground level. Like your arrow is going to come uh, be launched at ground level. So it's a very different angle than we're used to in the United States. Right. We're opposite angle. <laughs> yes. So you, you got to learn that. And then you got to learn, you got to understand the organ placement of the animal that you're hunting. Because most of the farms are going to have around 20 to 30 different species on the farm. And yes, these are all high fence properties because the poachers, you got to keep the poachers out. It's not to keep the animals in, it's keep the poachers out. So there'll be 10,000, maybe 20,000 acres, right? All high fenced and all electric, you know, electric fence. And it's, it's lethal. I mean, whatever touches that fence from the outside doesn't survive. Uh, so the high fence properties are to keep poachers out. And, you know, you got 10,000 acres to hunt on. So that's a lot of real estate the animals can hide in. Um, yeah. And so... There's usually 20 to 30 different species and it's usually very plentiful and you'll see a lot from, you know, it may not be the animal you're looking for, but you'll probably see two or three trophy grade animals every day that you hunt and you'll get shot opportunities almost every time you hunt. Um, it's just magnificent. So the hide is, you know, half underground, half above ground. Um, all very comfortable. You, it's basically a concrete box that you're in. And um, you'll usually go sometime be in what we call summer months or uh, June, July, August. Those are the primary months to go. You can go anytime, but those are the best times to go because it's winter there. It's the Southern Hemisphere. So it's winter, but it's not very harsh winter. It's like Georgia winter. It's, it's, it's not terrible, you know, cold. It's not like Nebraska cold. I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's it's like Georgia cold. Um, but I mean, you got great animals. They have different organ. They, their, their organ placement is very different from ours. Usually they're a lot more farther forward than our American, you know, deer or any of our animals. So you, you got to trust your pH. Your professional hunter is going to tell you where to shoot that animal. Um, and they're, they're stout. I mean, going to take a lot to kill them. Um, they're very tough animals. Um, you can hunt anything from very common animal, which is an impala, and beautiful animals. Um, they're smaller than a united than a whitetail deer. They're usually right around you know eighty pounds. Um, the impala, and very quick, very very fast, and they can string jump you like nobody's business. I mean, that's they're just amazing. Um, all the way up to a buffalo, you know, a you know cape buffalo. Uh, which they call Black Death, which for good reason, I mean, over 200 hunters a year are killed by uh, Black Buffalo. Uh, so the Cape Buffalo. And um, so they're very dangerous animals to hunt, especially if you put a poor shot on them. Uh, so you got to be very good at what you're doing, very circumspect about how you handle yourself in the bush with 
an animal that can take your life. And um, the buffalo and usually the leopard is out there. You know, you, you probably are going to encounter those. Um, so you got to be very careful about what you do and how you do it. Uh, but it's amazing. Um, great animals, all very different. Obviously, I've been able to harvest, um, I think, 16, 17 different species so far um, in South Africa. Um, it's incredible. Great people. You know, just a wonderful experience. If you get a chance to go, you, you know, I highly encourage you to go. If, if any of your listeners have any questions about, you know, going not just with me or with anybody, just if you want, you know, have any questions, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I have some experience over there and I'd be happy to share that, that experience. Cause there's some things that you should know and some things that you can do and that'll help your, your experience along the way and how to get your animals back. You know, once you shoot something, what happens to it? You know, how much does that cost and who do I trust? All that kind of stuff. When you go with a really good outfitter, um, they'll have all those answers. I mean, if someone books a trip through me, we usually have about five Zoom calls together with the group and to try to answer all their questions about packing, about travel, about food and lodging, about expectations, about everything. And uh, to, so they're very prepared about what they're going to experience. Um, and so there's as few surprises as possible. Um, and they have a really great time and they have a really good experience. Um, it's not, it's not nothing financially. It's, I mean, you know, the average trip is going to cost you between five and $8,000. Depends on the animals that you shoot. So they depend on the animals. There's, there's a, basically a, a charge for animal that you shoot then. Yeah. Different animals cost like, like an Impala. Are you, you, you probably know what an Impala looks like, yeah. right? Okay. So Impalas, are usually around $300, maybe $280 to $300. That's it. I mean, they're very economical. Yeah. Um, warthog. I mean, a warthog, that's 150 bucks usually. And they're, I mean, you, you know, it's not like a buffalo, which could be 10 grand. But if you've never killed an Impala before, right? I mean, it's, it's like the greatest trophy in the world, you know? Yeah, it's such a small animal and so quick. Yeah. That's, yeah. That sounds like a challenge there. Oh, it is. I mean, I've killed a couple Impala in, in my life. I, I actually, I was, I was hunting a kudu on this property for a TV show. And we we're after this one kudu. And we did finally get the kudu uh, down after three days of, of walk and stalk. And the farm owner was like, hey, I need you to, to call out some, some Impala. It was like, man, you do because you got way, way, way too many Impala on this property. I mean, everywhere you look, there's Impala, which you might think, well, that's not bad. But yeah, they're looking at you, right? So if they see you, the Impala, 50 of them or 100 of them start running, everything in the, in the bush starts running, you know? So you got all those eyeballs watching you. You, yeah. you know, it's not great. I said, you got to get rid of some of these. He goes, yeah, well, I need you to take out some. So I, I ended up shooting eight Impala in like two days. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's very challenging, but the better prepared you are, um, the, the better experiences you're going to have. Um, so, um, and then, you know, Impala are inexpensive. Warthogs are inexpensive. You go up to like a, a blue wildebeest, which is the poor man's buffalo, right? They're huge, you know? It's it's like shooting a buffalo, but like one-tenth the price, <laughs> you know? Um, I, you, is sable or, I mean, I shot an eland, which is the largest antelope on the planet. It's part of the antelope species, and it's the largest of all antelopes. It's around 1,500 pounds. I mean, a huge animal. Yeah, um, that's huge. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the buffalo I shot last year, he weighed 2,000 pounds. So, I mean, th there's some big animals. There's some little guys, too, out there. Um, I, I shot what's called the Spiral Slam of South Africa, which is uh, a kudu, uh, an eland, a nyala, and then a bushbuck. 
Bush Buck's probably, I don't know, 40 pounds, maybe. I mean, just a real small animal, but very elusive. And it was the hardest one of all the four to to walk and stalk and take a and take a, a good shot on. So um there's just so much to do there. And then you got Kruger National Park. We usually book two days in Kruger National Park um, with our clients so that they can see the big five in the wild, you know, elephants, uh, hippos, rhino, lion, leopard. Uh, y- you can see all, and then all the other animals of South Africa are there too. But I mean, <laughs> it's just an amazing experience uh, to get to go. And it may be once in a lifetime, but if you're an avid hunter, it might be something to consider uh, because it, while again, it's not nothing in terms of the money, it's, 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 it's a little bit of money, but um, you, the experience you get is unmatched, unparalleled. Yeah. That sounds like that would be really interesting to go over there and, and, and do some hunting. Now on, on your archery equipment, is there any kind of special requirements you have to have on your archery equipment for, for hunting over there? Um, no, uh, there are some pragmatics though. So for most of the planes game, you know, I'm shooting 65 pounds and a 125 grain, uh, broadhead and I'll shoot a mechanical broadhead and, and possibly a fixed broadhead depends on the animal. Um, you know, mechanicals are going to give you a really great cut, but you better be right on with that shot. Right. Right. Um, and, but a fixed blade, you know, they want you to have no more than three blades. Two is best to get deep penetration. Um, so, no, I mean, you need to be shooting. I mean, we took some hunters over that had low poundage bows and it it was problematic. Um, but you need to, you need to be pulling about 60 pounds, you know, at least to be shooting these animals. And then some of them, you really need to be pulling 65, 70 pounds. Um, you get into an animal like a sable, which is about the size of a horse, an eland, which is that big thing, you know, that yeah. 50 pound thing. You better be pulling 65 pounds. Otherwise you're not gonna get the penetration that you really need. And the animal will just be wounded. Yeah, that's the last thing you want. Yeah. And then if you're going to go for like a giraffe um, or a buffalo with a bow, uh, you better be pulling 80 pounds. And then you're going to have a really heavy arrow, a really heavy setup. You might have a 200 grain. um, You'll definitely have a 200, maybe 250 grain uh, fixed blade for that buffalo. You have a two blade, you know, fixed, fixed blade broadhead. And your shot better be good because here's what happens with the buffalo is that once they're attacked, like shot. I mean, they don't die right away. Uh, they don't just like, boom, hit the ground and they're dead. Not like whitetail. Um, they, once they get attacked, then their defense mechanisms kick in and they determine whether they're right or wrong. Doesn't matter. They determine what attacked them. Right. And then they're going to kill that, whatever attacked them. As long as they're alive, they will not stop. So if you put a bad shot on a buffalo, especially with a bow, because you're going to be relatively close, right? You're going to be, you want to be about 30 yards, maybe 20. Uh, They're going to have, they're going to be able to see you and you better have some guns with you. Um, But if you put a good shot on the buffalo, then it's like a non-event. I mean, they don't even hardly know they've been hit. I mean, they're not spooked. They may, they don't even know they're bleeding out, you know, if it's a good shot. But a bad shot with a bow or a gun, that's that's extremely problematic. And that's where people get hurt and sometimes killed because that buffalo is in the thick brush. I mean, they just come out from nowhere and they don't stop. They don't stop until whatever they think attacked them is dead whether it's another animal or human and that's that's and there's no tree to climb i mean you go well just climb a tree well all the trees are little spindly things with really sharp you know thorns on them every tree it's just every tree everything over there will bite you stab you prick you i mean it's 
mean. I mean, the thorns are about that long on those trees. Uh, yeah, kind of like our locust trees. That's right. It's covered that's with right. thorns. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you really have to know what you're doing, right? I mean, this is, I mean, you can you can put a bad shot on an impala and that's that's a shame. But you put a bad shot on a buffalo and that could be dangerous. That's dangerous. So, you know. Something to think about when you're going over there. Make sure you know how to, your equipment works. And yeah, yeah. Get like, good shots. Yeah, like when we go, we take clients and we make sure everybody shoots their weapon, you know, before they go in the field. Um, and, you know, when someone says, hey, I got that 300 yard shot. I mean, they usually don't. I mean, they don't. They might at the rifle range, but in front of a an animal or species, you know, that's a different thing. So, um, you know, we really want them to be close so that they can put the best shot on the best animal that they can. Yeah. And uh, mostly the bow hunters are, are, are usually better prepared, you know. And we tell people, look, you should enjoy yourself over there. If you want to stay up all night, you know, playing cards and drinking, you should do that. <laughs> But you ain't going hunting in the morning. No. <laughs> so you need to be you need to be sober. You can't be under the influence of anything when you're hunting. No. Uh, it's not fair to the animals, you know. It's not fair to wound an animal. And um, it's not ethical. So we we tell people, look, you're grown adults, you know. And if you want to stay up all night doing whatever what you want to do. That's awesome. It's your trip, man. It's your trip. That's great. But, you know, if you're going to get up in the morning to hunt, you need to be, you cannot be intoxicated. You cannot be under the influence of anything. So it, it's just not, not appropriate. And I've never had a problem. I've never had people that that's been an issue with, honestly. So, I mean, they pretty much understand that. I mean, people go over there. Uh, bow hunters are, Oftentimes, better prepared, uh, better hunters, honestly. They have to be, right? Right. So um, I've had great experience. I've had any bad, I've had one experience where the guy, one, one client was, you know, he's just kind of whiny and gripey and stuff like that. And we had to have a little come to Jesus meeting with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just say, you know, you really just need to look around you and just take in the beauty, man. You are in South Africa. You're in the most wild place on the planet. There's nothing that you need to be worried or, or, or upset about. Nothing matters. So let's just go out and have a great time. Or you can stay here by yourself. We don't care. <laughs> you know? I want to, but you're not going to come with us and spoil <laughs> you, the you, attitude. You can't, you can't be like you are. Cause he was just like, you know, he was not healthy emotionally at the time. So um, he just didn't need an attitude check from a, you know, a loving, but, you know, firm, you know, sort of perspective correction. And sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And, 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 and to this person's credit, I said, look, I want you to go over to that rock and just watch the sunrise for 10 minutes and then i want you to come back and tell me how you feel and he said all right i'm still going to be pissed i said you should just go over there and just 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 and he came back and he said i don't know what happened man i'm sorry i'm just an idiot he used a different word but that's okay <laughs> you know <laughs> and i said it's all right man it's it's all good let's go hunt and he was great the rest of the trip, it was just like, I don't know. Just had to turn on that sunrise in his mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every now and then people get, they become porcupines, right? Life life can can push you in that, in that direction every now and then. And sometimes you just need, you know, you know, someone to come alongside and just say, it's okay. Uh, but it's not okay to stay this way. It's okay to be this way, but you can't stay this way. And <laughs> yeah. we're going to help you get past this. And we're here for you, man. So, and, and 
that's all it takes most of the time, you know, uh, just to say, look, it's okay to be, you know, grumpy or whatever, but it's not okay to stay grumpy. That's not okay. So let's find a way to find your, your joy again, right? Why are you here, man? Why'd you come? Well, I came to experience beauty. Yeah, there it is right there. You know, let's go open, do that. Open your eyes. Enjoy. And yeah, it's like, I don't know why I'm such an idiot. You know, it's like, well, we, we wonder that too, but you know, uh, it's okay, but it's not okay to stay, you know, unhealthy. But I mean, that's people, right? People are messy. You know, yeah. I'm messy. You're me Everybody's messy to a certain point. And you know, sometimes a little grace goes a long way. Yeah. And also just watching the sunrise is, is kind of interesting. I, I know, um, during, during the, the rifle season, I was out there, um, sat up over the alfalfa field and as the sun's rising, I got my tripod with my phone on it, take pictures, you know, I want to video this stuff. So I'm taking pictures of the sun coming up and, you know, kind of my background, you know, that you got that dark and then the sun coming up in there and caught some of those. And then the, the next time I was out, I sat over the cornfield and I had pictures over that. And, uh, you know, I, I posted those. It was kind of, kind of interesting, you know, the sunrise and, you know, I kind of titled sunrise over the cornfield or something. Yeah. I you mean, know? it's, it's the great reset. I mean, Hey, yesterday may have sucked, but a sunrise and you, you get another day. You know, yeah, yeah, and, and uh, I I experienced something. You know, you see so many eyes out there seeing everything. Um, I was sitting over the cornfield um, with the rifle. I was at about seventy five yards from where, where my ladder stands at. Uh, there's a field on the other side of my ladder stand. We don't have a shot over there because we're not we don't have permission to hunt there. So I seen this doe come come kind of trotting in. So I turn on the camera, get it watching. And I'm getting getting all ready and figure it's gonna, you know, come across on, on our side that I can shoot. No, then it it kind of run it took and run off, put a tail up and run off. I'm like, next thing I know, here's three more more does come running through the field and they just run off together because the other three come running in and this one that was just kind of moseying around down there, it took off too because if there's something was there and that's kind of what you was talking about, you know, getting rid of some of those. Uh, Impala because there's just so many of them, so many eyes. And, you know, yeah. that one doe would have come over, I think, you know, may have come over, may not have, who knows. But the camera was running. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to return, record the shot. And that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's great. Well, man, I just looked up and saw the time. We've, we've spent an, an hour and a half chatting away. It didn't seem that yeah. long. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they go long, sometimes not. Uh, but it's been great talking with you, and and I had um, a lot of a lot of information I gathered from you, and and you know, learning about the, the products that you have, you know the the no scent and the um, uh, the trees treasy or treason yeah treason treason yeah treason and the the no scent you know that's really cool cool stuff looks like and um, you know we'll, we'll put in a description I'll have a link to those sites in there for you. And then get them out there. And uh, when I post it to my YouTube channel, I also have links in there as well for it. And we'll just, um, you know, get your name out there. And and it, it's been a lot of fun. And I learned quite a bit from it. And hopefully our listeners to it. If you know, if our listeners want to take a trip to Africa, you know, you're you're the guy. And uh, um, if they want to get a hold of you, what would be the best way to get a hold of you to talk about? Uh, you it? can email me at mike at treason .com. Okay. I'm on, I mean, I'm on Facebook. You can private message me on Facebook as well. Yeah, I'll put those links in the description as well. So it make it easy to to get a hold of you. And you know, last time I tried to run, I was like, okay, what was that site? You know, I was like, okay, yeah, right up, oh, playback, ready to no, I'll just look in the link in the description. It's in there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there I have to make it easy for them. So yeah, it's been great, great talking with you. And I, I'm sure we'll we'll hear some more stories and you know if anybody uses any of your product, hey, make a comment. Let us know what you think of the product. Uh, it looks like to me it's going to be a really good product to to get a hold of. So uh, we'll just be looking looking for that comment in here. 
Uh, my name is Roy Canterbury. I've been hosting Arch Talk 101 uh, with Mike, and we will see you on the next one. All right. Thanks, Roy.